I'm going to start from what is probably the kind of common popular attitude or feelings that are engendered when you talk about intelligence in the universe, especially since there's a lot of talk about something called intelligent design. You can't not invoke some sense of God. And so um, there is one way that is not just unique to people in our time, it's actually been true of cultures all over the world and for most of history, that God or supernatural agents are somehow making our existence, making the world, and tending it. So God is the intelligence behind the universe is a very important theme and a very important mode of understanding that peoples have always had. Uh, and it's, as I said, not just Christian. Obviously the first slide was very Christian in its inspiration. This is uh, a god, Oleron. He's from West Africa and he has two heads and several arms and he's managing to orchestrate both the moon and the sun and all of the living creatures that exist. So, supernatural beings, gods and angels, create and guide and move all the stars, the planets, and all living creatures. And that's still a common uh, theme that people will fall back to and say, well, God is doing it. God is what makes all of this possible. Um, that's not the approach that I'm going to take today. I don't mean to say that I'm not uh, aware of the deep and rich mystery that the universe has and that it should evoke some of our deepest feelings about uh, the sacredness of things. But I'm going to start with the fact that in the 19th century, this belief became unsupportable. This is not, it's not possible to really hold this belief. And it's really not possible to hold it even in our time, even though many people do. Uh, so what happened? Well, in, eight, in 1805, this is uh, over 100 years after Isaac Newton's discoveries of the laws of motion, uh, a very fine scientist named uh, Pierre Simon Laplace he was a Frenchman, and he took Newton's equations and gave them the most sophisticated mathematical analysis and development that they had ever had up until that time. And he was able to work out the equations of motion of the planets and the sun and the moon as they were known at the time. And he developed some very powerful techniques because these equations, when you actually apply them to a system of planets and sun and all, become enormously complicated. And he did not have computers. Uh, he used a technique that is called perturbation theory. And so he was able to work out, one of the things that he was able to work out was uh, his analysis showed that the, so the solar system actually was pretty stable whereas Newton had thought it was very unstable, that it eventually would break up and fly apart. Now, it's true that the solar system doesn't have an infinite lifetime, but it's, it's not going to fly apart because of that. It's going to be consumed by the expansion of the sun uh, in a billion years or so. So uh, this very important development, and Laplace was not alone, it was accompanied by just a real rich renaissance of mathematical discovery about the laws of motion. And um, here's a little uh, look in, into the book. Uh, Laplace was uh, a very important person in France, and uh, Napoleon uh, was very interested in science. And Napoleon uh, called up Laplace and he said, uh, you've written this big book all about the solar system and all about the 
all of this, all of, all of what's going on here. But you never mention God. And Laplace famously replied, I had no need of that hypothesis. What he meant was he could explain the motion of all the planets, all of the observations, following the simple mathematical laws that come from those equations of motion. And those equations of motion are very simple. You can write them down on a page, or even a half a page, or even I could state it in one word. The planets move in such a way that they minimize the action of the motion. All those laws follow from this principle of least action. It's just unfold it, and all, out comes all of these equations. But it comes from just this simple least action principle. So the Laplacian clockwork universe runs according to mathematical laws. So they're not angels or gods that are taking care of things, so to speak. These mathematical laws are running in the same way a clock might be running. So uh, one of the things you could, if you, if you really want to hold on to the idea that God is doing everything, this gets you into thinking, well, God made the clock, and he set it going, and now it goes. But this didn't come out of nowhere. It had to be created, and so God created it. But this is a very unsatisfying position, uh, and it's not one that you have to hold at the same time that you don't believe that God is in that anthropomorphic notion of a big man taking care of things. Um, this Laplacian universe is also deterministic. What that means is everything that was set up in the initial state of the universe, all the positions and all the velocities of all the particles in the universe those had to be somehow put into play. Once they were put into play, everything that's going to happen after that is determined. Um, and this is a consequence of the laws of motion. There's just no getting around it. Uh, even very chaotic, complicated motions, planets spinning, asteroids and comets going on very unstable trajectories, they are really complex. They're enormously complex. But if you trace all of those motions back, they go back to a particular initial condition. So the Laplacian universe is not only clockwork, like it's deterministic. Now, just on a practical matter, this is going to seem not true to our experience. It doesn't seem true to our experience. And it doesn't help to say, I don't think it helps to say very much to say, well, that's because you can't figure it out. But in fact, we've all been programmed right from the start. The building, everything here, the stars, is just playing like a video. Uh, it's not very compelling at all. And in fact, I, I hope to convince you by the end of this lecture that it's not true. Um, so, uh, Another important scientist who actually predates uh, Laplace a little bit is Christian Huygens. He was a Dutchman and did a lot of really important work on optics and electromagnetics, as it was known at the time. But one of the things he did was he took Newton's laws very seriously in the same way that Laplace did. And he could see what I have just told you about them. And so what he said was, well, that's true for these planets and the solar system. But look at life. If you look at life, how do Newton's laws explain life? So he, as many people have, said, well, there's really a miracle in the production and growth of plants and animals, even though there isn't in anything of what he called the lifeless heaps of inanimate bodies. And this is still a compelling argument that a lot of people find. Uh, so there's a way also in which religious feelings associated with God also get funneled and focused down onto life. 
that when it comes to life, this is really where God steps into the picture. Um, I don't think this is a very good position for religiously oriented people to have, even if it's just basically you're going to end up in complete retreat because at the turn of the 20th century in the 1900 to 1920 period, there was a very strong sense of, this is before DNA had been discovered, before um, uh, its connection with uh, evolution had been established. The, there was a, a movement in biology called vitalism. And the vitalists thought, well, yes, you have all of these molecules and they're physical and they're made of atoms and so forth. But at some point, some mysterious force is put into them and then they can become living. But it had to have something come from the outside and put into them. And a lot of people, I think, would still want to believe that. And Huygens certainly would have believed that. Um, because that's where you could say that's where God is. God comes in at that point. Uh, but this is not a successful way or a good way to think about divinity and biology. Um, because, as it turns out, <coughs> DNA and evolution can explain and describe what's going on in life. And you don't hear anything about vitalism anymore. You don't hear about this missing ingredient that God sticks into matter. Uh, it's virtually disappeared because we have an account now <clears throat> that describes how all of this takes place. Now it doesn't mean that it's not full of wonder and mystery and uh, a sense of reverence about how amazing this process is. But it's not a man, a God-like man, a Jesus man, or a Bo some man, big and intelligent and powerful, somehow stepping in and making things happen. You have to have a much more grown-up sense of God. So, Huygens is in error, and I'm going to try to explain to you why he's in error. It's with this lifeless pile of inanimate matter. That's a mistake. Because that matter, made of atoms and molecules, those atoms and molecules are not lifeless by any means at all. They are quantum particles. And quantum particles are not little marbles or little specks of dust. They are a community of active agents called quantum operators that observe and act on one another. So if you, you can't even open up a quantum particle because you don't see it as like a little box or a little marble. It's like this intense region of activity. But if you could open up and look into this intense region of activity, what you would find is a community of physical agents. These agents are described by an algebra of mathematical operators. Now, that's kind of abstract, but they, that's, that's what it comes down to. Um, and these operators observe and act on one another. So it's almost as though what's going on in this microscopic quantum level is something that's kind of social, kind of like what goes on at higher levels of animals and even human beings. Very striking, very amazing. So who are these agents? Well, one is the position agent. It's very fundamental. The momentum agent is also very fundamental. There's an energy agent, and there are more. These are the primary ones. And every quantum particle has these agents. These agents interact with one another. They can observe one another. 
They are animated by the force fields of electromagnetism and gravity and nuclear forces if we go down to that level. So there is a force field that these particles are activated by and these agents communicate with and interact with one another through those force fields. So here's a little sort of idea of what these force fields might look like. Suppose we just had, over here on the left, we have a positive particle like a proton. It might be the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. This is just a positively charged particle. And over here is a negatively charged particle, an electron. Now these are just the centers. Those are the centers of the forces. Then it doesn't look like a little marble. That's not what you'd see. And the forces are revealed by these kind of lines here. I don't know if I have one here. No, I don't. But have you ever seen uh, pictures of magnets with iron filings sprinkled around on them? And, those, and you shake it, and the iron filings will line up along the force fields of the magnetic field. So there is what I'm trying to describe and show you is this physical force field it has this quality of action at a distance. It, there, there isn't anything touching anything else. It just flies through space. The, the, the signals are propagated through space. And um, so quantum agents use their observations. What are the observations? They, are, they just want to know the positions and momentum of other agents. They don't have a complicated society. It's a very simple society. But what they need to know is one another's positions and velocities. Because if they know one another's positions and velocities, those are the things that tell them where they have to move in the next instant of time. And in fact, this is described and was described first by Newton's laws of motion. And they're an equivalent set of quantum laws of motion that do the same thing. So if the, the quantum agents position, the position agent can observe the momentum agent of its own particle. It can also observe the momentum agent of another particle. So they make observations and each agent, as it makes its observations, uses that data in the law of motion to tell it where to go next. Now, here's where things start to really get interesting. If, if that's all there was, it would be just like Newton and Laplace. It would be completely deterministic because it, you would assume that those agents can all actually get the positions and velocities of all the other particles which have to go into that equation of motion. You might assume that. And in fact, a lot of physicists, in fact, still do assume that. But the fact is, there is a very important principle in nature called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And it turns out these quantum agents can't get a precise observation of the state of position, where the position and the momentum of the other particles are. That is a fundamental principle of nature. And it's a really important principle. It's in fact, I think, uh, one of the most important principles that vitalizes and gives the universe dynamism. So what that means is if the agents can't faithfully observe the actual state of some other agents, they get instead some random data. So they don't, instead of getting the correct state, it's a little bit off, a little bit wrong, a mistake even an error, if you want to look at it that way. But this is just the way nature works. Nature is designed, in fact, to do that. So in particular, the position agents and the momentum agents of the same particle cannot faithfully observe one another. And this builds in right at the fundamental root of the dynamics of motion, this uncertainty. So here's a way you can think about this. So here we have these quantum agents. I want to ask you to imagine them 
and they're all existing in this community. So think, the, think of the, they're all in the space. So we have a bunch of agents, and they're all like air. I'm going to use an arrow as, as a representation of them. So these arrows are all laying around in space. So, uh, in fact, these quantum agents uh, are vectors. They, that's really actually what they are, mathematical vectors. Um, or more precisely, they're operators, which operate on vectors. So, agents who fully see one another are like two arrows that are parallel. Or if you like, they're like um, two faces that are completely facing one another and can broadcast their states and receive their states completely faithfully. But some agents lie at a different angle. And agents who lie at a different angle are not going to see the whole face of, of one another. They're going to be missing some information. And that's true for position and energy, for example, in many cases are faithfully communicating, but momentum and position are always incapable of this uh, faithful communication. And so there will always be some random information on those observations that those agents make. So some agents will use random data in advancing to the next state in time. And it is in this manner that randomness enters the otherwise deterministic quant world. Quantum mechanics too would be in deterministic if there was this omniscient capability of all the quantum particles to observe one another. So this is like the genius of uh, nature in, in many ways. So the randomness isn't injected into the, into the quantum world by some external agent. It's not God outside or anybody outside putting randomness in. The randomness comes about in the normal course of the particles interacting with one another and the different position and momentum and energy agents interacting with one another. We, we're all aware of randomness in human affairs. You know, the stock market has got a lot of randomness in it. The traffic has randomness in it. Your daily activities have randomness because you don't know. But, but you still have to act. You still have to make a decision and act one way or another, uh, even if you are wrong. And uh, yet, out of it comes society. Out of it comes behavior and life and we move along. Uh, I don't want to overdo the analogy between quantum community and human community. That's way too big a stretch. But there is a certain similarity in the, from an information point of view. That these very elementary particles have a similar information incompleteness that is true of all of us at higher levels of existence. We, we have incomplete information. That's even true, for example, of the tectonic plates on the surface of the Earth, which have a set of equations of motion that tell them what they should do. But they need the signals, seismic signals, coming from other tectonic plates and this is a very uh, chaotic, in many ways, set of signals. So the equations are uh, subverted, so to speak, by the fact that they just don't have the complete information that they need. And this randomness ultimately originated at the quantum level. Even though when we're talking about tectonic plates, we're talking, not talking microscopic. But all of this microscopic randomness propagates upward and gets into higher levels. Um, if you take a nitrogen molecule in the air and one of the electrons on that molecule 
has a little quantum fluctuation that is unpredictable. Um, it, it takes a few microseconds for that fluctuation to sort of propagate into the near field of the molecule, and it takes some order of, of uh, seconds before that then starts to infect the air right around the, that molecule. Can't be quite the same as it would have been if that little fluctuation hadn't happened. It's very small, but in the atmosphere, the atmosphere is fundamentally unstable. What that means is it takes small little fluctuations and amplifies them. You've probably heard of the butterfly effect, in which a butterfly in the Amazon can, flapping its wings can cause a typhoon to take place in the Sea of Japan. Now, it's not, that's not, not quite accurate. What's accurate about it is that all of the large-scale motions are a, are a <clears throat> assembly of small-scale motions which are growing and competing with one another. So these little quantum fluctuations, some of them may be actually damped and killed off by other ones that are growing. It's like there's a competitive, uh, almost evolutionary race that's taking place, and some fluctuations are going to grow and become large. And those are the fluctuations that we observe in our experience. See? So, uh, you've seen bumper cars at uh, amusement parks. You know, these little bumper cars that go around. Um, you can calculate using uh, simple relationships of quantum mechanics how many bumps those cars can make before a quantum fluctuation in the atoms that make up the car send it off on a slightly different course. It's surprisingly very small. It's only about 10 collisions. So after 10 collisions of the bumper car going around, the first one or two collisions, quantum, you could say the quantum <coughs> effects are trivial. They don't have any, any role. But after 10 collisions, you actually are seeing a quantum effect. You can't observe it as a quantum effect. It just looks like more randomness. But that's the point. The point of this is randomness just doesn't come from out of nowhere. The randomness we experience in the large-scale world had its root in the quantum nature of matter and the fact that these quantum agents didn't have complete access to one another's information. Um, so here's a a watercolor of William Blake, and it's a very nice watercolor that illustrates what I'm trying to talk about here. It's, uh, he was very taken with uh, English mythology, and uh, these are three figures here. Uh, the first one is Law, and you see that's the male, the big guy, and you see the, the mythic figure is Urizen, you see that he's got a chain around him. That's that Laplacian chain. And he is bound by law. But he, maybe if we thought of it as uh, the discovery of quantum mechanics, he gives birth. I mean, it's a sort of mythic birth story, just like Adam and Eve. He gives birth to this uh, Anithermon, who is a, a inspiration, poetic inspiration. So you can't see the poet there, but she is sort of this principle of poetic inspiration. And they together have a child who's named Orc, who is freedom, who is basically uh, a child of freedom and rebellion. So out of this triad, you sort of get the reality of what it's like. It's not all law, and it's not all freedom and chaos. They are woven together in the fabric of the universe, and you need them both. You need them be because without that randomness, there's no yeast, there's no ferment, there's no uh, bubbling up. So let's get back to intelligence. 
So here's what I think is a, a good way to understand and define intelligence. It's the ability to acquire knowledge. So you have to be able to acquire knowledge and be able to act on it. So the knowledge isn't just to sit on a shelf. The knowledge is germane to how you're going to act. And so it has a lot to do with agency. Quantum knowledge will contain some random, which is new information. Um, I think that's another important point about randomness, because randomness, most people think of it as a defect. And that's not the case. Uh, the random information is new. It didn't exist before. Because if it was Laplacian, if we have some kind of state that the equations of motion that Laplace was working with bring you to this point, it's not new. It was right back there in that initial condition that has evolved from it. So it's not new. It's old information. There's only one information in the Laplacian universe. But in a quantum universe, new information is always being created just by the interaction of those quantum agents. And we might also add, what really is important about intelligence is not so much about acquiring knowledge. It's the capacity to correct and modify. Um, the great computer scientist Alan Turing defined intelligence as the ability to make mistakes. Because those mistakes were like a resource. I think of it as uh, this little vignette from science scientist in the lab doing this big experiment and he's he, he knows the result he's expecting to get and he's working away and then suddenly somebody they look and they say that's funny that's funny that's funny that's something you weren't expecting and in many ways it's as valuable or more valuable than what you were expecting so we can you can correct so freedom of agents allows them to correct random errors. Or, with the new thing you've got, which you weren't expecting, maybe use it for a new resource. For example, that's the way natural selection works in life. Uh, you're all familiar with these, aren't you? Boy, do you need those. Can you imagine what, what you how stuck you'd be if you never could use cancel? How do I get out of here? You get yourself someplace on a website and you're stuck, you can't get out? You want to push the clear button, right? Clear, cancel. And then you did it wrong. So you want to use undo. But then you discover that that actually was right, so you need to now do a redo. And then you just want to get rid of something forever. Delete. All of these are very important parts of intelligence. The editing, the correcting, the modifying, all of these are intelligence activities. So quantum mechanics is the science of the art of the universe. And what I like about quantum mechanics is it really brings together science and art. It brings together the law and it brings together inspiration and imagination. So here's our, our Blake trio again. Science with Erzin, art and quantum freedom. All one happy family. Okay, now, I haven't said anything about it, but people always want to know about intelligent design. And I, and I don't think I probably have to say much about it from what you've already heard. Uh, intelligent design is this theory that 
Uh, the universe is designed by an intelligence. And we just, we, if we if really look at the, at the way creative uh, design takes place, every artist will tell you the accidents are crucial to their art. The unexpected, the things that they didn't plan on, these are all important parts of art. And uh, it's a big mistake to think that uh, the universe is designed according to a blueprint in a, an omnipotent intelligence. It's demeaning of the divine. It really is degrading and demeaning of the divine to think that way. Uh, uh, it's better to think of God as a uh, passionate artist rather than some kind of omnipotent designer. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a simple illustration. I, I just thought of this uh, a day or so ago. I hope, I hope it'll work, work. I want to give you an idea about um, why randomness is actually more interesting than uh, determinism. Um, so I was thinking of a robot program. So suppose, suppose I have just a square here. I have four places. One, two, three, four, back to one. And I want to program a robot to go around that square. So I might write this program here. So it has only two things. It has something called position and step. Position is one, two, three, or four. It's where you are. So that's what position is. Those are the, it takes those four values. Step is the size of the step you take, like one, one step. And the program is, it starts here, it says, take whatever position you have, uh, add to it the step, and put it equal to the new position. So it puts position, the new position is equal to the old position plus the step, and then repeat it. So it's a simple robot program. Okay, so uh, here I go. I'll, I'll start with position one, say it's this one, and the step size will be one. So here I go. One, repeat, two, repeat, three, repeat, four, repeat, five, there is no five. Five, five, five. So the robot is stuck. The program keeps running. The program, the robot is stuck. So then the uh, I, I look at this and I say, I didn't I didn't realize that I got to cover that case. I have to go back and correct correct what I did. I made a, it's got a bug. It's not right. So. Now, I put in this little, this little catch. If the position is equal to five, then make the position equal to one, and now repeat. So now, when I'm ready to go and I got five, I hit that with my corrected program, and it says one, and so there I go to one. I guess one is back here. And now, it will just keep going around forever. So now I've got a really good program, and it, and it goes around forever, and it's very boring. So suppose instead, suppose instead of all of that, suppose I had rather imperfect parts in the robot, and I had imperfect parts in the program. For example, suppose that my the part of the program that's supposed to add the step is kind of clunky and it sometimes gets confused in it or rusty or corroded or something and it subtracts instead of adding and it just randomly might do that because it every now and then goes on the fritz. Well what would happen in that case 
and I don't do anything. I just use it's the same program I started with, with originally. It's just that the thing that I thought it was going to do, which was to add the step on, instead it's sometimes it's subtracting it because it's faulty. Well, then what happens is I'm stuck here at five, six, and so on, and all of a sudden it it hits that rusty spot or it slightly goes off and now it starts subtracting. And then I'm going backwards and I'm no longer stuck. And I go backwards and possibly if nothing happens I'll get stuck at the other end when it's trying to go to minus one because there is no minus one. So there it is stuck there. But then, boom, lo and behold, there's the random flipped again and so now it starts coming around again. Well you can imagine this with a really big course and it randomly choosing the step size so that it chooses five steps and then it chooses minus three and then it gets minus one and then plus ten. And so you could entertain some children with this. Uh, you never know quite what it's going to do. And that was for doing nothing. That was for living with the error. That was for living with the mistake rather than trying to fix it up. When I fixed it up, I got this really boring train that goes around the track and never does anything else. So, um, randomness is a resource for creativity. So, quantum nature is unpredictably dynamic, it's ever fresh and creative, it's intrinsically mysterious, it is a window into the divinity in creation. And I think that is where I will stop. So maybe if you have some comments or questions. Stop it was one. What's that? Stop it was one. <laughs> Um, I think all of the exotic ideas about uh, quantum uh, uh, entanglement in the brain is off track. I do. And there are plenty of, I'm not alone at all, there are plenty of people who uh, have done calculations trying to and imagined other schemes. The original scheme was proposed by Roger Penrose, very fine. Uh, in fact, he's one of the most creative thinkers around today. Unfortunately, there's two great things that he's creatively thought about. Both turn out to be not true. But I don't think that's anything to be held against them. They were bold speculations. They were really wonderful imaginations. And I, he's, he's a favorite of mine. But uh, he was thinking that you could have quantum superpositions in these microtubules in the neurons. And when people actually tried to analyze how fast the decoherence rates would be and so on, they just, they just wouldn't work out. And so then they would try to modify the model, change it, and so on. I think it's kind of a losing proposition. I don't think that particular aspect of the brain's operation is quantum, but that there is randomness in the brain, yes. It's ultimately quantum in origin, yes. Are the, are the quantum agents that you refer to, are those activities physically visible in the collider or some? Yes, they're, 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 they, uh, uh, the most fundamental experiment actually uh, was done in the 1920s. This is where this was first starting to all come clear. Uh, experiment with the uh, spinning atoms, spins and atoms. This is a very simple quantum system. It's only got one degree of freedom and it has three agents. And um, these agents can't all be observed together. Uh, if you can only observe one of the three, 
The others, when you observe them, you'll get random, random results. So they would do things like, they would, so th these, this particular quantum system, the position and the momentum are taken over by uh, spins. So there's a, three different spins, three, three rectangular components of spin in three-dimensional space. So you line up you you line up all the atoms and you send them send them into the detector and if they're all prepared in the spin up so that their spin is uh, vertically upward and your detector can detect it can detect all three spins it can detect if they're vertical it can detect if they're horizontal in this direction it can detect if they're horizontal in this direction so there's three, those three directions. So you have all these three detectors going. So if you look at, so here comes the particle that comes through, and you look at, at, and you have a whole bunch of them. They're all lined up. So the first one comes through, and it's spin up by the vertical detector. In fact, every one will, will, get, will give spin up because they were prepared that way. Then you look at the other detectors. So maybe the first one that comes through says it's, it's spinning in, say it's this horizontal direction down here. Here's the vertical, now we're in the horizontal. We want to see what that detector is giving. Maybe the first one it says it's pointing that way. Then the next one comes through, it says it's pointing in the opposite direction. In the vertical one, we never found one was pointing down. They were all up. But in the other two directions, what you find is they randomly go both ways. And that's, that's, there it is, right there. There's your random data that comes from the fact that those horizontal directions can't be correctly observed. Or faithfully observed. And that what they're observing are singular atoms or particles of? Uh, uh, they're observing a spin, a spin on the atom, yes. It's a spin state. And that's included by electronics? Yes, uh, you can, they, they will, what they do is they, uh, they basically channel the particle so that uh, it will slam into a, it, there's a curved path that is taken through a magnetic field so that it, if it's up, it goes that way, and then it hits a detector. And if it's down, it goes this way. It hits, and it hits the opposite detector. So they, they get a, which, whichever detector it hits tells you which way the spin goes. And on the vertical ones, they're always hitting one detector. It's not as though that isn't a, they don't get a reading on the other ones. It's not as though the particle comes through and it doesn't have anything to offer. They get a reading but it's not repeatable. Even though everyone's prepared spin up, the next one that comes through might be horizontally uh, pre given a different result. And there are numerous experiments that are on that theme. You can do it with light, atoms, magnetic dipoles, um, and this is, there, this is a fundamental feature of quantum mechanics. And what's interesting is it's not just in the experiments. Uh, quantum mechanics is built on what is called an operator algebra. And that operator algebra has this feature just as part of it. If I just said, here's a mathematical structure. Let's explore what, what it requires. That math mathematical structure, incidentally, if you're interested, is called a Hilbert space. And when you explore it, it has this Heisenberg uncertainty aspect. It has this fact that information can't be completely shared or completely known. So then this raises the question, well, God knows, doesn't, does God know all of what's gonna, what, all of these things that nature doesn't know? Does God violate the Heisenberg principle? That's kind of a hard question, I think, because you could ask that even in human behavior. Unless, Does God know all the things I don't know? If you believe he does, he does. But what, what 
I would prefer to believe is something that's physically identifiable and measured in a lab. Right. Yeah. yeah. There. Right. Yes. So there's no reason to posit a personal God. A God is a person. In the mystery of creation, is there any reason to think of God at all as, as, as a prime mover or a word of is, is, is that useful in the hypothesis or that drops out of really? It's just mystery. Well, well um, I think you should, you should put more weight on personal. Uh, more weight. Yes. Uh, in other words, more you should shine a spotlight on the personal, as more so than God, um, uh, because that's a very human concept. It's very human. What about the rest of the universe? But it's a human experience, also the transcendent. So where do you place that? In vain imagination. Oh, I, th I think I think it's pretty easy to. Uh, to have a sense of transcendence because we're so finite. It's pretty, that's okay. real easy to come by. So then you might posit God then as a state of being or a state of awareness, ultimate state of awareness, and transcendence. Who's, I mean, who, who's awareness, whose awareness are we talking about? <laughs> I, believe, I believe that we all share part of each other's consciousness. I do because of telepathic experience and <clears throat> things like that. Well, I'm hearing your words right now, and there, there's a sharing that's going on right now. Right, absolutely. But sometimes there's a sharing that goes on when no words are spoken, and people have experienced telepathic experience. Mm -hmm. So that would suggest something about the beyond the transcends everyday, our everyday normal perception of what reality is. The idea of uh, extrasensory perception or things that we can't describe but yet act upon us or is a very powerful uh, feeling that people have. I'll be honest and say I'm very skeptical of, of all of it. Um, you haven't had the experience of it. It's a subjective experience. It's not something you can write out in the uh, That may well be the case. I haven't had the experience. Uh, but I have looked at the experiments where people have done them, have tried to signal across to people without any physical communication, but just trying to think the thought, and it would go across. And I think those experiments are very, are very uh, they're not credible. Um, but that's my, that's, that's my. Again, you know, that's, perspectives are so different, you know. That's, that's my, that's my, that's my science, I, I'm wearing my science hat. <laughs> not my, not my religion hat when I'm doing I'll that. Call or my spiritual call hat. Well, I, I see as well in uh, your question, how does that connect with God? The connection between humans is a I see that there's definitely some, some transmission in our electrical function of our brain that, that we share, all of us share. So where, does, where does some, how does that get us out of this world of human? I don't know that it gets us out of this world of human, perhaps it brings us more into it. Um, you know, Religious thought uh, evolves just like any other field of thought. If this were not the case, you know, we'd still be worshiping the sun. Let's go with this type of statement. Religious thought develops like any other thought. I think that's totally in there because science builds on facts, observable. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's what people religious, are religious men are trying to do. Religious beliefs are beliefs that have no foundation in. Physical world. Well, I, uh, I think uh, I think you are on pretty solid ground, actually. 
uh, using the, the kind of richness of human social interactions and in human psychology that there's a lot of room for intuition and uh, feelings that you can kind of guess what somebody's going to do, you kind of expect them to call and there they call. These things are just natural parts of, we shouldn't uh, uh, degrade or downplay human psychological experience. No, but that's what I think all, all religions basically are, is a form or a house uh, that houses that images towards growth and knowledge and learning, which scientists and biologists have. Religious people have that urge too, but it's more like an intuitive search. Whereas a Bible, those in the scientific field, is rational, intelligent, form, formula writing. And, and experiments. Yeah. And verification. Right. And, and so, and in the other field too, that goes on too. And then you have the Any other comments okay. or questions? Well, I think cell phone is extra sensory perception, communication between other people. <laughs> <laughs> but there's an ability to somehow, that something's going through the air that can be. You know, one of my. One of cell phone yeah. That you can communicate with somebody in Paris, France with your cell phone. Right. That's incredible. One of my, one of my fundamentalist friends actually <laughs> focused on that and said, how does this thing work? How does it do that? It's magic. Well, it is magic. It is, it's magic, but, or let's put it this way, it's magic without magic, which is, you know, without, 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 um, it's repeatable. Yeah, well, no. Oh, well, Yep. Yes. I, I didn't understand your answer to my question. Right? I, I think I didn't get to answer it, actually. Is there any reason to posit divinity? I mean, like the earlier philosophy you quoted said, I don't need that hypothesis. Yeah. Is there any, any reason to posit that? Uh, if you've got any poetry in your soul, you cannot but stand before the mystery of each day and each moment and say, I am in the presence of something of great mystery and uh, I will call it divine if you like, but it's beyond me and yet it's enormously present and it's for if, for if you've got some poetry in your soul, the, the world is drenched in wonder. And um, that's not trivial. It's not, it's not, it's not secondary. So we don't have to posit it to. I mean, there's this thing in the thing in itself, what it just is. You know, we don't have to have a reason for it. It just it's, it's Yes, yeah, sometimes you, you think the debate over the existence of God is yeah. ridiculous. But of course, there are gods, and then there are gods, and there are, and there are gods who fight with each other. I'm the real god, you're the fake god. <laughs> <laughs>